And this is, uh, this is, like I say, a very different kind of sermon. Uh, the title itself uh, may get you to smile a little bit. Some serious spiritual study of a seemingly silly song. A lot of alliter alliteration. I couldn't even say it. Alliteration there, okay? Uh, it's a sermon for Twelfth Night or Epiphany. And as I said before, this was a big deal in the earlier church, though it's not celebrated uh, particularly by, by Baptists and some of the less formal churches today. Uh, and we're going to talk about the song, The Twelve Days of Christmas. And this is how many people see the song. This is how Charles Schultz, when he did Peanuts, okay, saw the song. He's got Linus there going absolutely crazy as he hears again and again and again, you know, first day of Christmas, partridges and pear trees and all of that sort of thing. And many of you, as indeed I often felt, this is a silly song. What's the point of this song at Christmas time? And I never really had a satisfactory explanation until... A number of years ago, someone uh, gave me a book, uh, this book. It's a children's book. It's called The Twelve Days of Christmas, The Story Behind a Favorite Christmas Song. Now, whether it was one of your favorites or not might be debatable, but the point is it's the story behind it. And I began to look in that and then began to do some extra study and actually in a prior church came up with a little children's play, which turned out to be a lot of fun involving the various elements that are in this supposedly or seemingly silly song. So as we move on along here, though, um, let me just go ahead and adjust the next slide here. That's the book that inspired the sermon that uh, I'm presently printing, uh, going to be speaking to you. And Twelfth Night, a little bit about Twelfth Night. This is the historical background. The background of the sermon is someone gave me a book and I made a play out of it and then came up with the sermon. Well, Twelfth Night was also called the Feast of Epiphany. The first known celebration of it took place way back in six, in rather 567 B.C. Okay, I don't want to get deluged with a whole bunch of history here. But it's important for us to know this has been around for a while that the people celebrate. And what they did, as it says, it commit, commemorates the, uh, the gifts of the, of the Magi, uh, the supposedly three wise men. The early church even had names for them and everything, though it's not necessarily in the Bible record. But uh, it commemorates their coming to see the baby Jesus. And uh, the other interesting thing about that was that they began to, as, as more and more they began to celebrate the nativity, celebrate Christmas, it actually was a 12-day celebration. It began on Christmas Day, which was set by the Roman calendar as being on the 25th of December, which is what we still have today. And then it continued for 12 days, thus 12th night, which is coming up this Thursday night, the 6th of January. And for many, many, many years, for hundreds of years, the church celebrated the 12 days of Christmas. And uh, I know we don't do that much nowadays, although one time we, <laughs> little aside story here, we encouraged my mother to do this because she was sending so many gifts at once that the kids were overloaded with gifts. We thought, hey, Mom, let's do a 12 days. I began to notice some of these things. Let's do 12 days of Christmas. So send each of them one gift each day. Well, she sent one box each day from UPS. It was filled with gifts. So she didn't quite catch that, but that was Mom. Anyway, uh, so, you know, that's how they celebrated back then. Now let me fast forward just a little bit to uh, a, a later time, considerably later, in the 17th century or the 1600s, the Roman Catholics in England were persecuted. Now usually those of us who know a little bit about church history, we know about it the other way around. In the 1500s, the Protestants were horribly persecuted by the, one, the queen who was called Bloody Mary because she had so many of them put to death, they died in the fires and so forth, they burned at the stake and all that. Well, then Queen Elizabeth I came to power, and a lot of the church was restored, the Protestant church was restored, but they decided that, uh, you know, it was time for, for them to gain a little vengeance on the Catholics. And so, yes, there were Roman Catholics who were persecuted in England for their beliefs, and they were not allowed to teach the catechism, which is their 
group of spiritual truths. Now, some of the things in the catechism, I'm not suggesting by any means that we all suddenly start uh, knowing the Roman Catholic catechism, but some of the things are erroneous and are not scriptural. But the things that are expressed in a few minutes, I'll be sharing them, are all biblical, for the most part at least. They're mostly biblical and mostly uh, things that I think we could apply in terms of our own doctrine as well. They're the basic doctrines of the Christian faith and catechism was taught to the little children and that was forbidden during this time in uh, in the uh, you know the time of the uh, persecution of the Roman Catholics so they developed a song a song we know as the 12 days of Christmas and that song taught the catechism truths almost as a code In other words, you can almost picture a Catholic family maybe huddled around the fire or listening to Mama, as in the slide here. By the way, all the pictures come from this book, okay? Uh, But you can picture Mama teaching the children, and all of a sudden, one of the high officials from the Church of England comes in and says, what's going on here? And all he hears is they're talking about nonsensical things like, you know, French hens and and swimming swans and so forth. They They don't know, unless they know the code, what's really being taught and I didn't know this either and don't feel too bad if you didn't know it because obviously Charles Schultz who wrote the the book here that we saw the first slide he didn't know it either but these were actually code words for significant Bible truths and that's why I'm going to take us through very briefly you don't have to worry it's not a 12 point sermon here but I'm going to take you through briefly what each of these things counted for what they what the code was for so if we look first of all at the next one we get on the first day of christmas my true love gave to me who is the true love well that was god the father who is our ultimate lover god the father of us all we know that for example and they're it's throughout scripture, but look at Second Corinthians chapter 9. Uh, you don't have to look there, but Second Corinthians chapter 9 verse 15 simply says, Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Or James 1.17 tell, tells us, Every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father. The Father God is the one who, when we sing this song, is the true love. My true love gave to me. It's not, it's not a courting song of a young girl, young boy. It's about God. And that's what the code meant initially. The first day of Christmas, who is true love? Well, it's God. God is our true love. As we move on to the next one. Whoops, I went one too far. The partridge in the pear tree, well, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Something interesting about partridges is that they will give, the mother partridge will give her life for her young. We know there are a number of birds that do that, who will go off, even act wounded or whatever, in order to try to get the predator away from the young. And the mother partridge is known for this. So just as Jesus was protective of his own and even sacrificed himself for his own children, that is us, then he died on the tree, the pear tree in this case. The partridge in the pear tree then represents Jesus Christ who was willing to sacrifice himself on the cross. This is the best and first gift. The first gift given, my true love gave to me what? Jesus Christ who was willing to sacrifice. And, of course, we know that from the best-known Christian verse in the entire Bible, John 3.16, say it with me, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is the first gift that is noted in the song. My true love gave to me, And so I've called it Jesus' redemption, so free. When we get to singing the song decoded a little bit later, that's what it says. But let me move on now to the next one. The second gift, two turtle doves. Now, turtle dove and dove are basically synonymous, okay? Two doves, 
uh, that were given. And we know a few things about doves. First of all, in, uh, in Luke chapter 2, verses 22 on through verse 24, Joseph and Mary bring the baby Jesus to the temple to be presented in the temple uh, for his dedication, which was in accordance with the Jewish law. And they have to offer a sacrifice. Now, rich people could offer sheep or goats or even maybe a bullock, a, a full, uh, you know, a full bull or something like that. But poor people were allowed to offer turtle doves. And you can read in that passage, okay, that they offered a, a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law with the Lord, a pair of doves. Two turtle doves were offered. We also know that doves represent peace. I mean, that's universal. That's not only biblical. We, we always, when we think of a dove, I'm sure in your Christmas cards, if you got very many at all, there were some that had a dove on it, representing the dove of peace. We also know from the scriptures that the dove represents the Holy Spirit. What happened, for example, in Matthew 3 and verse 16? Let me read that. As soon as Jesus was baptized... He went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, descending like a what? A dove upon Jesus. The dove represents peace and the Holy Spirit who brings peace. And yes, thank you, Susan. Susan's pointing out in our back window back there, there's a dove, which is, as I say, universal uh, really, not only Christian, a universal sim symbol of peace, but especially a Christian symbol of peace, as well as especially a Christian symbol of the Holy Spirit. So we've got the partridge and the pear tree. We've got two turtle doves. Now we move on to three French hens. And there they are, three French hens. French hens were considered to be a, a delicacy, to be considered to be rich people could have French hens. Okay, uh, not everybody had them. And they represent the three gifts of the Magi. Once again, this was a celebration, remember, of Epiphany, the revealing the time of the Magi coming to uh, bow down and worship the Lord Jesus Christ. And, of course, we know the gifts they offered. Gold, which represents his kingship. Frankincense, which represents his priestly authority or his, or even as we sang in the song, his deity. And then myrrh, which represents his sacrifice. It was a spice used in burying. And so I often have said the Magi knew exactly what kind of gifts to give to the infant Jesus or the ba at that time a young toddler Jesus and his family. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh are the three rich gifts, we would call them, the three French hens. Then we have next four calling birds, four calling birds. There they are. And the four calling birds, remember, remember this is being taught to little children, okay, who otherwise wouldn't necessarily be able to get this teaching because the Church of England repressed it. But the four calling birds were the four gospel writers who called out through their gospels to the world presenting the life of Jesus Christ. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The first four books of the New Testament were the four gospel writers, and they were the four calling birds. Now, it's interesting to note that almost a third of these various gifts, and you can see that in your little bulletin insert, uh, almost a third of these little gifts of these gifts were birds of some kind or another, which is, of course, an interesting thing. But uh, nonetheless, the four calling birds represent Matthew, Mark, Luke, and, of course, John. As we move on from there, Five golden rings. This is the one everybody keeps kind of keeps track in the song by singing this one real loud. Okay, five golden rings. Well, it's like an anchor in the Bible as well. It's the ten command. Uh, excuse me. It's the five first books of Moses. We'll get to the Ten Commandments later. The five books of Moses. The first five books we find when we open up the Bible: Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Numbers and Deuteronomy. These are called the books of Moses. They're also called the Pentateuch, 
which means the five books. They're also called simply the law. When you hear in the Bible someone refer to the law and the prophets, they're referring to the books of Moses as well as the prophets also that came after that. The law is found in the first five books of the Bible, and that's what is represented by the five golden rings are the first five books of the Bible. I'd like to take just a quick summary here. How many have heard any of this before? Anybody? Yeah, see, we don't know a lot of these things, but it is interesting when you start to research. History, you know, our church history, we, we weren't just formed in a vacuum. There's been hundreds, even thousands, 2,000 years of church history uh, that impact how we know what we know and believe as Christians. Anyway, there was next one, of course, is six geese a-laying, and that refers to the six days of creation. As you know, on the, on the seventh day, he rested. If you ask somebody, how long did it take God to create the world? They'll often you'll hear people say, seven days. No, six days. Seventh day, he rested. Then he began what I call the recreation at that point, which is his salvation, his redemption for us, is, is everything that follows after he rested. But that's another, another story, perhaps for another sermon. At any rate, the six geese laying refer to the six days of creation. Day seven, seven swans a-swimming. Okay, seven beautiful swans. They certainly are bir beautiful birds. All of us have ever seen swans. One of the neat things about swans, I know my wife and I have often said this, is just that they, they marry for life, by the way. Uh, they, they mate for life, and they actually grieve when one of the spouse dies, just as we do, uh, you know, when, when a spouse dies. Um, but the swans represent seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, there are probably more gifts, but in Romans, and I'm going to take a, a, a moment to just share this passage. In Romans, there are seven what we call ministry gifts, motivational gifts. These are things that we as Christians, we excel in certain ones of these and maybe not in others. Um, I've taught on the gifts of the Spirit before. There may be more than seven. Uh, there are other so gifts which are disputed among Christians, some of the sign gifts like, like healings and so forth, which I believe in, uh, and, and tongues and so forth. But these seven are gifts, what we call ministrations. They're seven gifts that we operate within the church. Ideally, in every church, even a small church, even a little country church with a big Christian heart like Blanche, should have all seven of these gifts at least represented within the church. And so what are they? I'll begin reading at Romans 12, 6. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us, meaning some have one, some have another, and so forth, okay? And it's all according to grace. I mean, what's a gift? But grace, we don't, we can't say, well, look at me. I've managed to build up this, I've made this own gift within myself. No, it's something God, who is again the ultimate giver, God gives to us. And it goes on to say, if your gift is prophesying, which doesn't only mean predictive prophecy, such as telling what's going to happen based upon what God says, but also right now I am prophesying. Prophesying is preaching. Anyone who proclaims God's word is utilizing prophecy, prophesying, and that's uh, a gift that people have. Uh, then prophesy in accordance with your faith, it says. Don't go off prophesying about other stuff. You folks would turn me off real quick if you began to notice if I came to church every every Sunday and I started prophesying about how how good the new Lexus automobile is. I mean, I'm not prophesying according to my faith there. I'm prophesying maybe to make a sale, okay? So I have the word of God, though, as you do, and I'm simply sharing that word in prophesying. It goes on to say, if it is serving, then serve. Oh, I'm so grateful for the servants within the church. The servants are the ones who think to set up communion. The service, servants are the ones who make a beautiful tree in our, our fellowship hall. The servants are the ones who hang around after the church supper. Remember church suppers? We used to have those, okay? After church suppers, they were the ones that hang around to set up to get rid of the, you know, clean up things and set up the tables and chairs and so forth. Many have a gift of servanthood. Now, we're all called to serve, 
Don't get me wrong. It doesn't mean just because if, if I were to say, well, I have a gift of prophecy, so therefore I don't have to do anything else. Of course not. We all in some ways exercise all of these. But there are some that it's a deep motivational gift. They desire to do it. I think of Hunter out here painting this, the, you know, our walkway here, the, the, the ramp, or the railings on the ramp. You know, nobody said to Hunter, hey, Hunter, you know, go do that. It was a motivation on his part to do that. And, I, I, you know, all, all of us serve in some ways, but some have a gift of servanthood or serving. If it's teaching, then teach. I'm doing a little bit of teaching today, too. This is more of a teaching type of sermon, not quite as much preaching. I'm, I'm sharing overhead projections and, you know, that kind of thing from a PowerPoint. Uh, so it could be considered teaching. I'm imparting some new knowledge uh, that you may not have known in the past. But if it's a, a really good teacher is one who draws the knowledge out, who causes people to look into it for themselves and doesn't just pontificate as to what it is. There is a difference between uh, prophesying and, and teaching. Uh, and it goes on, though, to encourage and give encouragement. The uh, apostle, or uh, I should say the disciple Barnabas, in the New Testament, his, his name means son of encouragement. We have a dog named Barnabas. But his name means son of encouragement because he was an encourager. When Paul was left out on the desert, nobody really wanted to hear from Paul because he'd been out persecuting Christians. Barnabas is the one that went to Paul and encouraged him. You have, God has given you this. You need to go out. And Paul became, what, the greatest evangelist of New Testament times. So Barnabas was the encourager, an exhorter, someone who helps pick you up and say, look, let's get, let's get going again. I know you're discouraged because of this, but, you know, let's move on from here. That's an encourager. Then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. Some have a gift of giving. We're, we're grateful for those as well. The church needs resources to continue operating, and some just, they feel good. And usually it's an interesting thing. The people who have a gift of giving are also those who are blessed by God, usually in financial means, because they have properly followed God's plans, which include giving for financial health. And so therefore they tithe, they give. Doesn't mean we should all, oh, let's just depend on the people who give and we don't need to give anymore. No, we should tithe, we should give. But there are some, it's a motivation. They desire to do it. And then it goes on to say, uh, if it is to lead, do it diligently. Some people are good administrators. Thank God for them. Uh, if it's to show mercy, mercy means the person who, when they hear about someone suffering, whether it's physical suffering, emotional suffering, they're usually right there. They need to go and de or they, they pray ex with extra meaning for that person. Um, often people who have a gift of mercy are very deep feeling people have a gift of mercy well those are just the ones that are mentioned in uh, paul's uh, epistle there uh, to the romans but that's what uh, we have here with uh, the uh, the six uh, or i'm sorry the seven swans of swimming the spiritual gifts let's move on now to eight maids a milking if you know the song you know where we're going next eight maids a milking eight maids a milking what does that refer to well, according to what was taught to these children in the catechism of the Roman Catholic Church, that refers to eight beatitudes found. And a lot of you know what the beatitudes are. They're found in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. You find them in Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 through 10. Blessed are the poor in spirit. There's one. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn. There's two. For they... Uh, will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, there's three, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. That was number four. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers. We'll be talking about in that in a future sermon about the, the, the uh, fruit of the Spirit. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The eight 
be attitudes that Jesus expressed to his disciples and possibly to others as well in his great sermon on the mount, those Beatitudes. You can see how a young child can pick up some very important basics of the faith through just going through this song once the child knows what they refer to. Nine ladies dancing. Nine ladies dancing. They look like Christmas ornaments there in that particular slide. Okay, that refers to nine fruit of the Spirit, which is found in Galatians 5 in verses 22 and 23. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And that's uh, actually, I'm giving you a little bit of a, of a prelude here to what, Lord willing, I'll be beginning to preach next week in a nine-part a nine part sermon series on the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The fruit is what he produces in and through Christian people. It's different from the gifts. It's something that's produced. Often the gifts are involved in it, but it's produced in a person. And here it is listed in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Those are the nine ladies dancing. Now, ten lords a-leaping. There they are, ten lords a-leaping. We think of lordship, we think sometimes of commands and edicts. Well, they represent the ten commandments, which, of course, every child was taught, needed to know. How many of us today, and I include myself here, could go through and recite all ten commandments? But you know what? They're important. You say, oh, that's Old Testament. We live in grace now. We don't live under law. Whoa, 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 whoa. God's grace enables us to fulfill the law when it comes to the Ten Commandments especially. And so every young child would learn the Ten Commandments of God. And that was one of the ways they were reminded of that was by the Ten Lords a-leaping. Moving on to number 11, the 11 Pipers piping 11 pipers piping now in the culture of the anywhere from the 8th century on through you know this time when this was being taught in England and beyond often pipers would come into town and they would not only entertain but sometimes they would uh, would call people to attention to announce something uh, we, many years ago, used to use a bosun's pipe, and we still do some in the Navy. I have a bosun's pipe at home. You know, the twee that you'd hear sometimes if you watch a, a Navy film or something like that in order to get the attention of the crew. Well, these pipers who are piping are the 11 faithful apostles. Remember, Judas Iscariot, there were two Judases, but Judas Iscariot, Judas of Carioth, was not faithful. He was the one who betrayed Jesus Christ. But learning the names of the faithful ones, just about everybody knows the name of Judas Iscariot. How many of us know the names of the 11 faithful apostles as well? And by the way, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John are not all apostles, okay? Uh, you know, so they're not, they, they, they wrote the gospels, but they weren't all among the original apostles. But there were 11 faithful apostles and finally we get to the last one here and this is 12 drummers drumming now this is where it becomes a little bit what i call extra biblical we do not have the apostles creed in our bible many of you may know the apostles creed many churches even baptist churches do sometimes recite the Apostles' Creed. It was a creed that the church developed many, many years ago in order to formalize the basic beliefs of Christianity. And I have it printed on one of the pages. It's actually on, I believe, the back of the uh, page that has my notes, my sermon notes. On the back of that is the Apostles' Creed. I'd like you to take a minute to find it because I'd like for us just once at least to recite that Apostles' Creed together. And while you're finding it, I'll mention something here which has turned some people off, especially Protestants. There is a point in the older version of the Apostles' Creed where it talks about, I believe, in the Holy Catholic Church. The word Catholic is small c. 
Now, it's not found in this newer version that I've given to you. It says Christian church. But in the old one, it says the Holy Catholic Church. It doesn't mean the Roman Catholic Church. Catholic means true is what it means, ultimately. The true church of the Lord is what that means. But you'll see there are supposedly 12 basic tenets, and I kind of had to search around here to find what the 12 would be, which fit together the best, and I made some little uh, numbers there in red for you. But let's go ahead and recite together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, recite it with me, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father. He shall return to judge both the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Those guys, many, many hundreds of years ago, these people who met together in a church council to come up with this, came up with a pretty good summary of what our Christian belief system has to say, and that's the Apostles' Creed. So those are the 12 uh, gifts that we find, the gifts that we find in the song, and that's what the meaning of it is, those 12 gifts that God has given us, which are represented in the 12 days of Christmas. So, as I conclude, number one, be grateful for the gifts. Think of this. If you sing this song knowing the gifts, and in a minute we're going to do it because we're going to sing a, dec a decoded version of the song, okay? It's not something we normally sing as a hymn, is it? But we're going to do it today. It's a decoded version based on, on what I've inserted there instead of the various animals and birds and so forth. But be grateful. This is all. God has given us all these gifts and many, many others as well. Think for a minute, if you will, when we sing this song about it, maybe if you were a little child in a repressed country where these Christian truths could not be shared very openly, how it would mean to you to understand what God has given to you. Be grateful for them and then teach others these truths. Uh, the reason I provided the bulletin inserts and so forth, you might want to sometimes share this with your family. Maybe you want to have a 12th night party this Thursday night, have some folks over and, and talk about this because it's things most Christians have no idea. I didn't. You might want to share some of this in a future time. And then as we conclude, as I say, we're going to sing the song uh, before we move on into our communion time. So 12 days decoded. Let's sing it together. You can stay seated uh, as we sing. Well, let's stand up. You've been sitting a long time. Okay, let's stand up for it. And uh, we'll sing it together. If you wish to see, be seated, it's kind of a long song. So if you need to sit down, that's fine too. Okay, let's begin it together. We're going to do it a cappella. On the first day of Christmas, my true love gave to me Jesus, redemption so free. On the second day of Christmas, my true love gave to me peace and his spirit and Jesus, redemption so free. On the third day of Christmas, my true love gave to me gold, incense, myrrh, peace and his spirit and Jesus, redemption so free. On the fourth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me four gospel writers, gold, incense, myrrh, peace, and his spirit, and Jesus, redemption so free. On the fifth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me five books, the law. Four gospel writers, gold, incense, myrrh, peace, and his spirit, and Jesus, redemption so free. 
On the sixth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me six days creation, five books, the law, four gospel writers, gold, incense, myrrh, peace, and his spirit, and Jesus' redemption so free. On the seventh day of Christmas, my true love gave to me Gifts of the Spirit, six days creation, five books, the law, four gospel writers, gold, incense, myrrh, peace, and his spirit, and Jesus' redemption so free. On the eighth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me eight beatitudes, gifts of the Spirit, six days creation, five books, the law, four gospel writers, gold, incense, myrrh, peace, and his Spirit, and Jesus' redemption so free. On the ninth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me Fruit of the Spirit, eight beatitudes, gifts of the Spirit, six days creation, five books, the law, gold, incense, myrrh, four gospel rise, gold, incense, myrrh, peace, and his Spirit, and Jesus' redemption so free. On the tenth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me His Ten Commandments, fruit of the Spirit, eight beatitudes, gifts of the Spirit, six days creation, five books, the law, four gospel writers, gold, incense, myrrh, peace, and his Spirit, and Jesus' redemption so free. On the eleventh day of Christmas, my true love gave to me Eleven true apostles, his ten commandments, fruit of the Spirit, eight beatitudes, gifts of the Spirit, six days creation, five books, the law, four gospel writers, gold, incense, myrrh, peace, and his Spirit, and Jesus' redemption so free. On the twelfth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me twelve creedal truths, eleven true apostles, his ten commandments, fruit of the Spirit, eight beatitudes, gifts of the Spirit, six days creation, five books, the law, four gospel writers, gold, incense, myrrh, peace, and his Spirit, And Jesus' redemption so free. Good job. Give yourselves a hand. You did a good job there. Let's pray. You may be seated. Heavenly Father, again, we, we, when we start counting our blessings, we, we certainly run out of time to count them all. And Lord, if we want to get back even just to the basic blessings and basic gifts, Lord, looking at, at these as voiced by this old, old song reminds us all of these are gifts from you. Whether we celebrate them or not on the 12 days of Christmas doesn't matter. What matters is that we know they come from you and we know that you give them to us. Thank you so much, Lord, for the, the indescribable gift, as Second Corinthians says, the, the unutterable gift, the gift we, we can't even begin to fully uh, comprehend, which is the gift of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Above all gifts, his sacrifice for us, what that means to us. So now, Lord, as we move to this closing time of our service, which is our communion service, Lord, I pray we will be keeping him, that first and foremost and perfect gift that you give we'll be keeping him first and foremost in our minds as we participate in holy communion together this we pray in jesus name amen Amen.